You're listening to Creep Geeks Podcast. So it begins again. Welcome to the Creepies Podcast, Season 6, Episode 231. Be a paranormal skeptic or don't. It's all a simulation, and we know what your role is. Yeah. So, welcome back to the Creep Geeks Podcast. I'm Greg. I'm Omi. And we hope you enjoy this rant-filled episode. (laughs) Yeah, it's all good. Okay, so if this is your very first time listening to the podcast, we talk about paranormal stuff, weird stuff. We're an offbeat podcast. We talk about paranormal, cryptid, supernatural, weird, absurd things. Sure. Pretty much whatever we think is interesting is kind of what we talk about. So, you know, just kind of give you an idea of what, what this is all about. Uh, today's episode is a little bit different. <clears throat> I got a little, <clears throat> got a little COVID in my throat. Really? No. Okay. I do not. So let's do it like this. So it, we broadcast our podcast from an underground, undisclosed location, a bunker deep in the mountains of Western North Carolina. Okay. Yes, as I'm sure you know. And from there, it gives us a little bit of a different view on things. You know? Okay. And primarily why I say that is because over time, being the way we are and where we're located and what we're dealing with, the view that we have on things is uh, sort of earned. You know what I mean? Everything goes together. Uh, in a way that sort of molds your outlook on things, right? So you, you earn it by the, the way you're living, right? Even though we're in a place that's pretty uh, pretty populated for the most part, it's still pretty rural, separate. You know, people are sort of pigeonholed off on their little little communities there. It's just, it's hard to... It's, I, you mean isolated or insular? What? Insular. Insular? Yes. Sure. Okay. So, <clears throat> what I've noticed is this. The way we look at things based off the environment that we're in, right, with the interactions that we have, is different than some of the places that we've been to, travel to, experienced, right? Okay. And so we, we do a lot of traveling, and we go out, and we do events and things like that, and we, we've been all over the place to a certain degree. And what I've noticed, it really, is that when we're in those areas doing those things, uh, my viewpoints shift. Okay, as I should. Yeah. And then when we come back here, they shift again. Okay. So in a lot of ways, we're sort of a product of our environment based off the experiences that we have because of our environment. But that's that's usually based on individual perception. You would so. think, but is it? Yes. <laughs> no. Because no matter what or what environment you're in, your perception of things is not always the same as others' perception of things. Well, sure. That's, that's the whole point of perception. Yeah. Your perception is going to be different than mine based off different criteria, category, whatever, right? And the frame of reference is your previous experiences. And the environment that you're in. Yes. So, um, like if you watch a show on TV and they're talking about like, uh, I don't know, moonshining, right? Mm-hmm. You know, they, their idea of what's acceptable, unacceptable, what's right, what's wrong is different based off what they're doing, which is based off their environment. Yes. Which is the same for everybody. But to kind of get to a point, what I found is, is that the idea of paranormal, right, mm-hmm. as a whole or 14, whatever you want to call it, right? The the whole paranormal thing in general, whether it's, you know, supernatural or, or cryptids involved or UFOs or whatever, you know, your perception, your idea of all of that 
is kind of tied into your location. It is. Granted, that slowly changes with the younger generations. They have more access to information and just by who they are, like what generation, especially like millennial or Gen Z, they outwardly seek those other experiences or other frames of reference. You know, you would think so. Uh, granted, you are right. I do. I agree. And I'll give you a good example of that. We went to CryptidCon. And there Which was, was in Kentucky. Yeah, in Kentucky. And um, there are two different people who went around for different reasons. They weren't even associated. But they walked around and asked people what their favorite cryptid was. Now, granted, um, when you walk into CryptidCon, there's a big giant dog man statue thing. And there's a big giant Bigfoot one. So a lot of people may have gone to cryptid con because they're all about Bigfoot. Some people like paranormal. So some people may have said something else. Um, the answers range from Bigfoot to the Hodog to, um, uh, it's Hodag. Hodag to Mothman, things like that. But then they came around to me and my favorite cryptid skinwalker. Yi Nadaloshi. And just because that was my frame of reference and my series of experiences and my exposure to paranormal and crypto, cryptozoology, that's my answer. Yeah, well, <clears throat> my answer was different. I said based off what context. <laughs> yeah. And see, that's the thing because most people grow up in a specific region, exposed to, speci- exposed to specific folklore and urban legend, and that helps form that answer. You would think. Hmm. Um, Because that's what I would think. But like with the millennials and stuff and having the information of the world at their fingertips, I think it's so much. Mm -hmm. And not not to pick on millennials, but just say in general, let's just say the the social media um, savvy, like youths of today, (laughs) right? I think there's so much information out there and in so many different places. To get information, it's too much. Yeah. So they pick one or two Mm -hmm. or even three, whatever's most popular, whatever they most relate to, and that's what they stick to. Hmm. You know what I mean? Because when you, and it's almost the same thing if you're completely sort of isolated, right? Uh, you get exposed um, to whatever's available to you, and it may be one or two things, and that's what you go with. So as much as it's the same, it's different, hmm. right? And much as it's different, it's the same. And and thinking about this, it got me thinking about a couple different things, and one of the things was simulation theory. Okay. And the simulation theory basically is that we're, we're all living in a simulation, Okay. It's already, it's got a hierarchy, a framework. It's got, you know, it's just like a, it's a, it's a program, whatever you want to call it, but basically everything is sort of, uh, not real. Hmm. It's <laughs> right. a construct. Yeah. It's a construct. It's like, kind of like the matrix, right? And I'm not using the matrix as like, this is how it really is I'm saying in general, it's, it's, it's a simulation. Okay. And part of that is because, uh, humans have a tendency to look at patterns and repeating patterns and things like that. And then they memorize it and they go with it. And that it's sort of, and after a while, once you start to see these repeating, repeating patterns, it sort of triggers the different things. You see, I've seen this before. Is this real? Is it not real? But hold on. I mean, this is all vague because if you haven't figured out this episode, is pretty much just us sort of, uh, talking uh, a lot about vagaries. And trying to, you know, sort of get to a point, right? So it's, it's going to be one of those sort of weird sort of episodes where <clears throat> this is taking a helicopter view of some things that uh, we actually discussed on the way back from um, uh, buying a rotisserie chicken and eating it for dinner, <laughs> right? And so, uh, so the idea of the simulation theory is, is that everything is a simulation, whether it's a computer program or whatever. Elon Musk has talked about it. it it's, it's become a thing where people are like, it's all part of the simulation. Right. Like Morgan Freeman effect. That's a simulation. Right. You know what I'm talking about, right? Mandela effect. Yeah, the Mandela effect, right? Mm -hmm. It's all part of the simulation. And so to kind of get through it, right? So if this is all a simulation or, you know, much like a video game, you have your primary characters and you have other characters and you have other environment pieces and things that uh, make up the world that your character is in. Right? So... If this is all simulation, let's just say it's all simulation or game, what is your role in that game, Omi? To observe and experience so that Oh, you no, can... the role you play, what is it? Your primary character? 
In my particular <clears throat> simulation, yes. So I think most of us would say, yeah, we're all primary characters. You know, you know, this is my game, my world, my simulation. I'm primary character. Okay. Here's the okie doke. Mm-hmm. We're all non-player characters. In somebody else's simulation. Yes. Mm-hmm. So we're all NPCs in the simulation. Okay. And basically, if you look at like atoms bouncing around out in the universe, when one of the atom bounces against another atom, <clears throat> they're right, they interact. And whatever reaction happens because of their interaction is the path that it gets set on. Mm-hmm. And the result achieved is basically those two atoms colliding together. That's what we are. Okay. So we all think we're NPCs, or we all think we're the primary characters. We're not. Okay. There are no primary characters. We're all NPCs. They do our own thing until we interact with something else. Because I use this a lot. Like when people send me a comment on YouTube or whatever, on, the, on one of our YouTube channels, and they'll, they'll basically start the conversation off of, you know, something like, why didn't this happen or why didn't you do that? You know, kind of coming at you all hard, man, right? Okay. And I'm looking at it like, until I read this, you did not exist. Sure. <clears throat> so you are an NPC to me being the primary character in this game. Okay. But we're not. We're all non-player characters. And if you call somebody an NPC who's a gamer, they get all worked up over it. <laughs> and I'm not really a gamer. You know what I mean? I stopped yeah. playing games a long time ago, right? I mean, you know, like Zelda or whatever. I just, I just don't do but it. Like, and, and, you know, it's been brought up in popular culture recently. There was like that Ryan Reynolds movie that came out that was like he was an NPC and then suddenly he wasn't. Now the Matrix, another Matrix is coming out. Yeah. Um, or has come out. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't know. If, I don't know if it's out. Yeah. yeah, but if we are all NPCs, which would make sense, because in truth, a simulation, whoever constructed a simulation, it is to observe and record data. So if they're just literally watching us as though we were atoms and documenting us interacting, just you know, like an atom bonking together and seeing what happens, then that's great and all. However, if the realization ever came that we are all NPCs, that would drive individual characters or beings to not interact. Maybe that already happens. Maybe that's an acceptable percentage. I mean, if if that's the case, then I'm throwing myself off a cliff because, I mean, what point is, if there is no reason to pursue or have an endgame because this is just a big giant simulation, then there's no point for me as an individual character. I mean, that's short of my own observations and experiences and growth. If they don't really mean anything, that's kind of disheartening. Yeah, but that's the whole thing, right? <clears throat> because it goes, it kind of goes like this. If you don't know what your end goal is, right, or how do you achieve the end of the game or whatever, Mm-hmm. then it's all purely based off of whatever your interaction is and whoever you interact with and the environment that you interact with. And that basically determines at the end of it all, if you figure it all out and you give yourself a goal and you achieve that goal, then you win. See, I don't think if, if this isn't a simulation, if it is a simulation and we're all NPCs, nobody has any real destiny already chosen or picked out. Like they say, you can't tempt fate. You can't, you know, choose your own destiny sort of thing. I think at the end of it, it's like kind of like playing Plinko. Remember Plinko where you get little pegs and you drop a little puck thing and you hope to get $10,000 and it's bouncing all over the place? Mm-hmm. Well, there you go. So the choices that you make based off the random interactions that you have eventually sort of help you decide what your own path is. In other words, your path really isn't chosen. It just it is what it is. And then once you have enough interactions, then you sort of decide what path you want to be on. That sounds like both a lazy yet grandiose way to explain away the mentality of let the chips fall where they may. That's exactly what it is. And I hate that. Hey, it's all <laughs> random, right? It's all random. Because at the end of it, once that you think you have enough information um, – through interaction, whatever it is, whether it's environmental or people or whatever, you know, the NPC becomes the primary character in its own and it does its own thing and runs off and does its own thing. Because how many people have you met that you're like, if you start thinking about it in simulation theory and non-player characters, you're like, this person is obviously an NPC, Uh, right? They have like no interest outside of whatever the conversation is. They don't do anything. They don't want to go anywhere. They, They are obviously NPCs. When I was younger, a lot, and it would unnerve me. Because, like, okay, like, when I was younger, I was really into, well, I still am, super into arts and crafts. So I would go to 
arts and crafts meetups, like uh, knitting circles or like classes at like the local craft store. And when I would interact with those people, if it wasn't about crochet or if it wasn't about like a book that you had recently read, there was no depth to some of those people. Yeah. And it would just kind of frustrate me because I'm like, well, you know, I like to go outdoors. Well, how about this knitting pattern? And, See? And, and I mean, like I told you earlier today, when I would interact with people like that, it would just throw me back into my old school, when I was younger, favorite video game, Legend of Zelda. Yep. Where it, at w- one incarnation of the game, um, because there were, there were so many, you had you had the capacity to actually interact with every single NPC in the whole realm, in the whole level. And half the time, you would just sit there and you just keep hitting the button to let the NPC continue talking. At the end of it, you either got a great tip that led you further on your quest, or you maybe got a, like a part of a heart container refill, or you got a couple of coins. Sometimes you got nothing. And some levels... You got a lot of nothing. And that's how I would feel with some of these people. And it, and then later evolutions of that particular game, you had the capacity to throw chickens. Yes. <clears throat> little 8-bit chickens. Yeah, little 8-bit chickens. You could throw them at people. You could throw them at guards. You could throw them off the castle. And sometimes when I would interact with these very non... These people who did not express any depth about themselves, I would want to throw an eight-bit chicken at them. Right. Uh, Okay, so with that being said, and the interaction wasn't very fulfilling or Mm -hmm. didn't do what you needed it to do for whatever reason, Mm -hmm. then at that point you make the decision to move on, right, to interact with somebody else and maybe to not interact with that type of person anymore. Yeah. And there's the the thing. Mm -hmm. By... Having that interaction and knowing that that interaction did not meet any of your requirements for satisfaction, you move on and you've sort of discounted that, and so you've moved on to a different direction. And all those little twists and turns and interactions and stuff, that's actually what sets your path and direction. But that that's a set. In psychology, it would be called instilling certain perceptions. No, these are people. variables. Yeah, yeah. And in psychology, it's called one thing. In like, Growth and development, it's called another thing. It's basically that warped me into a sense of not interacting with several types of people. Yeah, but see, people. you say warped. Maybe it didn't warp. Or trained. Because or, on the opposite side yeah. of that, that one person was like, you know, this person wanted to talk about going outside and hiking and didn't want to talk about what I'm interested in, which is the crochet pattern. But if they, that's all they had It's in the them. okie doke. So the simulation is the okie doke. You're seeing it's like that's all they have, and that person is saying that's all I need. That's all I want. Do you see what I'm saying? So you have a whole score of people that are all NPCs to you, that are uh, to all of us really, that are uh, of a certain level or of a certain thing that you're like, okay, I've interacted with this and I will never do it again because they did not meet anything because of the variables that are in that situation, you know, don't do it for me. But then there's other people you meet and what, and this, this splits into two different things. There's other people you meet and you either become friends with them or you don't, or maybe you become enemies with them who give you a more robust perception of who they are they're into hiking they're into dogs they're into cats they they like a food you don't like you know, that yeah, sort of stuff they they have a different set of variables and that actually shapes the direction of the path that you're going to take eventually if you ever figure it out or don't it's the it's the old it, this is one of the things that makes me think that the whole simulation thing could kind of be true but if, if you if you make a constant Computer, let's say it's a computer program. If you make mm-hmm. it a constant computer program that basically um, the interactions and the levels and everything, there's no real rigidity to the, the variables that are involved, then you can play this game forever and never really achieve, you know, the complete goal or the fighting the big boss at the end to be the victor. But that that would breed a sense of disdain for people who either overachieve in the game or underachieve like in life 
people have a disdain for people that basically overachieve and have great success. And same thing with people that don't. It makes it very pointless. Is it though? It does not give me. It, it any goes drive. back to the thing when people say, "It's not the destination; it's the journey." And I don't like that. So. <laughs> that's that's fine, but there are some people that are okay with it, and they. It's, I think that in some ways they figured it out, and they they just like the interaction because they look at that interaction. That seems fatalistic. That small, that small little. It's only fatalistic if you make it that way. Right, So they look at that small interaction as its own individual sort of experience or game in that particular mm-hmm. second or however long that interaction is. And they look at each one of those interactions as being like the end-all, be-all. Let me give you an example. There is a person out there that by all means um, has gone through a lot just in general, right? <clears throat> but everybody that meets him says, dude's a nice guy who seems to thrive in in the interaction that he has with all the NPCs, Mm -hmm. right? And it doesn't seem that he really has the sort of strive to achieve what you think he should achieve. We could get into more advanced things like character build. Well, we're not going to do all that. Alignment. All those are just variables. Okay. And it's Keanu Reeves. (laughs) Yeah. Because we talk about the Matrix, right? Yeah. So it seems he's got a ton of money. Yeah. He doesn't have to ride the subway like you see pictures of him just chilling on the subway drinking a cup of coffee. Is this the Keanu Bill Murray thing? No. Okay. That would be cool, but I don't know what that is. But, I mean, so when you – as as you're looking at him, you would think that, okay, he should, you know, he should basically – with all the riches that he's obtained and success and everything like that through all the, the failures that he had, you know, like we're – you know, deaths in the family and all that kind of crazy stuff, losing his friend, you know, uh, River Phoenix. Anyway, all of that jazz, right? That he should be doing things a certain way to achieve certain goals or milestones that you would think that he would need to achieve to obtain some kind of happiness or some level of success that we're all comfortable with. Yeah. But he doesn't seem to need that. It seems like he's okay in the moment. Okay. And he keeps himself grounded by taking the subway. You know, drinking a cup of coffee outside on a park bench and talking to whoever comes up to them and being polite and listening to what they have to say. And then um, if he thinks he can make an impact doing things like paying off the mortgage on your house because you can't. You know, just things like that that you think, you know, is this actual philanthropy or is it something else? It's like he's just playing the game. Right? That's what It was um, the Bill Murray story is life lessons learned from a mythical man. Yeah. That was the example. Was. <laughs> yeah. Because, like, Keanu and Bill Murray both do that. And so. now, uh, from what I hear, Jim Carrey is doing that to a certain degree as well. Yeah. And there's this sort of myth out there that somehow or another they have obtained a certain level of enlightenment. Yeah. And they're looking at life completely differently, whereas they realize in the end they don't matter, nothing matters. You know, Which you are not the spark funny. in the universe that you think you are, and you're better suited to be part of it all instead of trying to be the standout for everything. Because two of those people have notorious reputations, or right. they have some colorful past to them where they were basically outcast or deemed unfit for the rest of society almost. Right. You but know, since they have learned their lesson, now they have ascended to yeah. another level. Okay. Because for a while there, Jim Carrey was the bad guy. He was crazy. You yeah, know? yeah, that's and, what um, they say. Yeah. And, and he says he was nuts too, but at the same time, you know. So <laughs> but he's it, always said the simulation. Yeah, but yeah. everybody thought he was like super crazy. But what if they're, what if he's just speaking the truth? And what if the other people that, that are doing this, that are known for this, um, aren't speaking it because they realize it doesn't matter if the other non-player characters know it's a simulation or not, or if it, if knowing that truth has an impact on their own interactions with other NPCs, would that change their course I would be, or their direction I or would, add too much undue influence to what their that path would be? Then I would be stuck very much in the same or similar mindset that Jim Carrey had early on, like where like he went to some award ceremony and like some uh, reporter walked out to him and asked him how he was doing. And he's like, oh, it doesn't matter. This is all fake. You know, it's a simulation. And then he just walked off. Yeah. And unfortunately, if this is the case, 
I'm going to start throwing eight bit chickens. And if it gets bad enough, do I start treating people like NPCs? I mean, well, I think we, we, all of us actually do that anyway. I mean, if, if this when is, you see somebody in a grocery store mm-hmm. and you just see them doing their own thing, just milling about, you yeah. know, and you don't go up and inter- actually, actually interact with them, they are a, just a two-dimensional character doing their own thing, and you don't really care. I mean, does that character involvement that you'd have if you went over and talked to them, is it even worth doing or not? There has to be something that triggers the interaction. And a lot of times it's just proximity. Yeah, if you I, get too close to them or whatever, because you need to do something, you're on your way, they're on their way, and you get too close, oh, hey, excuse me, you know, or, or whatever. But if this is all simulation and this is what it is, then what does it really matter, right? Uh, that's where I get into, like, my really failed background as, like, a programmer, and I'm like, well, oh, those people in the commissary, you know, in the grocery store, that's just the that are just walking by. That's the equivalent of the map skin. You well, know? yeah, but is it though? Because technically they didn't exist until you seen them. And you don't exist until they see you. It goes back to Schroeder's Schrodinger's cat. If but is there a cat in the box or not? Did the cat exact does the cat exist? I'll see or them not? if I live in the same area, I'll see them again. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, I go into our local grocery store every freaking Wednesday afternoon evening and usually the same employees are there sometimes there's people i don't recognize yeah but see they're only there there are they're only there because you've noticed them and you've noticed the pattern (sighs) and we all find it when you played when i played video games when i was a little kid right yeah and i'm old i'm like 50 something years old you played them enough to notice the pattern of how to these are the 18 things you need to do to get to this part where you need need to do whatever to move on to the next They're level. They're not only there. I mean, that's like okay. They are though. And uh, you you do these certain patterns over and over and over again to to move further into it, right? Or you try different avenues. I own a printer. The printer breaks. I know for a fact there is a call center I can call and no matter what, there are people there. I know that for a fact. Do you, though? Yeah. Regardless if I actually know the person, those people exist. Do you? Yeah. Okay, there's other people out there that don't own a printer that don't have any idea. That those people exist. Right. But they didn't exist until I thought of them. See, here's the thing. Here's the rub with the whole thing. There's thousands of printers. For everything that you think, there was someone else who either doesn't know or doesn't think that way. Those people are dumb. <laughs> and to those people that are dumb, they think you're dumb. And you know what that is, right? That's the basically the light and dark. That's the equal and the opposite. That's the the yin and the yang of the entire thing. The, you know, the positive, the negative, the ebb and the flow, whatever, right? Because if you don't have that that sort of force, counterforce, that ability, that inability what happens? It becomes unbalanced. And when it becomes unbalanced, it creates too much of a workload or no. a problem with the simulation. So it, it's a self-cleaning simulation. That That's saying that existence is a consequence, though. It really is. And if that's the case... <sighs> it's chicken or the egg. No, that, that puts... I don't know, that demeans existence. Maybe maybe not, though. You think it demeans existence. Other people think that's what existence is. I think there should be more to existence than interaction. I think there should be But see, the interaction actually determines your existence. And purpose is not justified solely on interaction. Well... If you go and you look at the matrix, that's that purpose. interaction and, and everything that happens, right, that purpose, everything creates energy. The energy powers everything. Energy needs a purpose. Now, you have too much energy that creates problems. Yeah, it creates chaos. Sure. Or which true. goes and bends outside of a construct. Right, so you have simulation. to have something to offset or basically get rid of the chaos. And that's where the point counterpoint comes in. Because at the end of the day, Right? The result is zero. That fills me And that's with how depression. binary starts. Zero, which is off, mm-hmm. and one that's on. 
It, so there you go, everybody. Rage against the machine of that concept. <laughs> sure. And for every rage against the machine guy who's raging against establishment, there's an establishment guy who's raging against the unestablishment. So there you go. Everything's a simulation, and you're a non-player character. <laughs> and Omi's lost the will to live. <laughs> <laughs> but see, that's just it, though. You determine your interaction. See, it's in that you have choice and no choice. You have no choice but to play the game. But the choices you make in the game determine your reality. Is this is this what's wrong with millennials? Is it's what's wrong with everything. <laughs> but here's the thing, though. Eventually, I'm a millennial, and right now this is just awful. But it's true, though, because okay, so l- let's go back to the '50s, where the '50s you were supposed to do certain things to achieve that perfect life, right? Okay. And that would be like having a job and a house and a car. That's just that's what everybody strives for: food on the table. You know, all of that stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And a house and a car and being able to provide and, and doing that sort of, you know, leave it to Beaver sort of, and if you're younger than I am, you probably don't know who the Beaver is. And, but to achieve that sort of, that's what you should be doing. And then you run across some dude who's happy making, taking banana leaves and weaving them into a fish trap so he can catch a fish to eat for the day because he lives on the beach in a hut somewhere. Or. Who has absolutely nothing, right? This guy has absolutely nothing and it's completely content, and you're supposed to strive to get everything, and you're not content. So it becomes unbalanced. Or since it's the 1950s Americana we're talking about, you meet that hobo who lives on the trains. You know. Right. You're like, you know, you should be striving for this. And it generation. really becomes happiness versus unhappiness. That's the okie doke to the whole thing. You got people that say, you know what? At the end, it doesn't matter. Who cares? I want to do what I need to do for me to be happy. And they interact the way they want to interact, and they're not worried about all these variables that control the game for the output. Hmm. Or the simulation. So there you go. It's all simulation. It's all a construct, if you will. And you're a non-player character. Okay. This thought brought to you by Creep Geeks Podcast. (laughs) So. But, you know, that's just something we thought about. And that, that kind of led into a couple different things when it comes to just the paranormal in general. The paranormal is made up of people, right, that believe and don't believe. Mm-hmm. And a gray area in between, right? Yeah. So if we take the simulation theory and we take the idea of paranormal, all-encompassing, whether it's cryptids, UFOs, all of that stuff. It can pretty much be down to believers and not believers, skeptics and non skeptics. Mm-hmm. Right? So, without one, you can't really have the other, and it puts no value to the thing. So, if you just had a, a world full of believers, then nobody would care. Okay. Because everybody believes it. Who cares? Move mm-hmm. on. I got other stuff to worry about, right? So, you, you kind of have to have one to offset the other to get that balance. Sure. So for every believer, there's a, a non-believer. And sometimes there's more than one non-believer. Because it has to balance everything out. So when it comes to the paranormal stuff, and you've got people that believe versus people that don't believe, and you say, well, who's right? Who believes? Who doesn't believe? Who's right? And the answer is nobody's right. In other words, the paranormal exists, mm-hmm. but it doesn't exist. It's real. But it's not real. It's all fake. It's all real. And because what happens with all of these thoughts that you have, it boils back to your perception based off your reality and how you're playing the game and how you interact with non-player characters. But don't you think, as far as, like, if we were to use a paranormal argument, like who believes skeptics versus not skeptics, do you think that the tide can get tipped and can cause further problems? Like Because right now, I'm looking at, a uh, recent study, October 26, 2021, now it, it shot up from like 36% a few years ago to now over 50% of Americans believe in ghosts. Yes. So does that mean it's no longer controversial? I mean. It just means that more people believe. Okay. And once that scale tips too far, hmm. then you'll have a counter argument or a counterweight on the other end of that, which will prove that ghosts don't believe. 
But then there's subsets within that community. Like, I think the last podcast I was arguing how I did not believe the mindset of one parent. I, it's not that I didn't believe. It's just I did not follow the concepts and arguments of one particular paranormal investigator because they conflicted with my own beliefs. Beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. Or thoughts. You know? Well, for every hardcore believer and every hardcore skeptic, you have people in the middle that can be swayed based off different variables, based off interactions with people, experiences, <laughs> things to determine which way. You're one of these people. Yeah. And so am I. That basically will pivot based off of their external stimuli. Mm-hmm. And that's what keeps that scale going from one side to the other. That's why it'll never be completely balanced, but it, it will, in fact, never tip one way completely or the other because it's balanced. And see, that's where, like, that whole, you know, you're saying that the, there has to be light, there has to be dark. And even earlier today, I'm like, well, I'm very, very gray on everything because, like, okay, sure, I think cryptozoology is a very valid study. I also believe paranormal is very valid. I'm not sure what is going on in paranormal. Like, I'm still forming my beliefs. But do I think Bigfoot is real? I don't know. I'm very skeptical. Something's going on. Yeah, but if you talk to like a local native group, they may they may say we have 200 words for 200 names to describe Bigfoot. I know. Throughout like like I was watching them finding Bigfoot through 30,000 <laughs> years, right? Yeah. So according to them, no, it it is what it is. It's a matter of fact, they do exist. So how does my grayness affect the other NPCs or not? Because there is someone on the other end who is not gray who is slightly more dark than you are. But what about And the there's person? somebody on the other side of that who is like, oh, I believe in ghosts, but I don't believe in UFOs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so for every viewpoint and counter viewpoint, for everything that you believe, there is someone who believes the same as you, not the same as you, or partially believes the same as you. And it all sort of balances this way out. This is why, with when it comes to paranormal and stuff like that, there's no winning. Yeah. Even if you showed Bigfoot, and, you know, pure 8K glory, as sharp as you can make it, somebody will say it's fake. Which is funny because... Even if you provide a body, they're there, going to say, oh, nope, that's fake. There's a post in one of the uh, Appalachia cryptid something something groups on Facebook right now. And it was this person who thought they were novel or original. And they're like, hey, I have an idea. Why don't we all post in this thread... The best, clearest, well-taken pictures, and I just started to cringe right there, that we have of Bigfoot. Not these blurry photos. Why don't we try to take good photos? And I'm like, first off, as a photographer, I wanted to chime in there, but I didn't. But just Because that's a trap. You just stay out of that stuff. Yeah, because anybody who is either interested in photography or knows more than their parents about a smartphone, do not fall into that trap. Because you're going to sit there and you're going to be like, this is the best photo these this particular person can take. Right, and that's you know. based off a variable. And that variable is <laughs> knowledge. Another yeah. variable is experience. Another variable. And so that's the thing with this whole thing. No matter what it boils down to, at the end of the day, they'll never be able to prove it's all a simulation. Mm-hmm. But they can't disprove that it's not a simulation. Which You'll is- never be able to prove that there's actual ghosts. But you can't disprove that there aren't ghosts. You see what I'm saying? It's funny because that's actually one of the points in one of the articles you've linked to for this podcast episode. We have show notes that have links to everything we talk about. And that particular point is it's not actually possible to prove we're not living in a simulation. Right. (laughs) And I'm like, it may be easy. They're saying it may be easier to prove that we're living in a simulation than to prove we're not. A nuclear physicist, uh, Davoudi, believes that cosmic rays, the most energetic particles known to man, would appear as pixel-like chunks if we were within a simulation. Think Minecraft, y'all. And unending beams if we were in a base reality. However, NYU philosopher David Chalmers doubts it's possible to prove that we don't live in the Matrix. You're not going to get proof that we're not in a simulation because any evidence that we get could be simulated. Yes. Yeah. So, which goes with the whole argument. Like, all of us keep saying, uh, bouncing around some of those theories, like Bigfoot is a ghost or Bigfoot is a UAV. If evidence comes around, is it because we vocalized those those points 
therefore that simulated evidence appeared. Exactly. And I'm annoyed by that. Right. <laughs> Which, I mean, <clears throat> it's just kind of one of those things where you can you can kind of hurt yourself. We've been talking about this for 40 minutes, and, and what have we determined? Nothing. Nothing. But it all makes sense if you look at yourself as not being the primary character in your own game or the game. You're a non-player character who, based off the interactions you have with other non-player characters, that helps to determine your success or unsuccess or whatever satisfaction of being in that simulation. Oh, man. And this particular... Because if you, if you look at it, right? Yeah. It's all about, <clears throat> excuse me, checks and balances. So if you're that guy with a fish, catching a fish a day... You know, with a fish trap made out of banana leaves and stuff like that. Living on the beach, doing her own thing. Completely sort of separate from everything else that's going on, right? Bucking against the norm, which is to get the house and everything from the 50s, like we were talking about about seven and a half minutes ago. There will be somebody who shows up that says, you can't live on this beach. This beach doesn't belong to you. Thereby wrecking this guy's happiness. His entire universe. Right. Yeah. So what does that do? That throws him back into the simulation to have different interactions to either, you know, to, it's in other words, it changes the path of direction that he's on. So changes, how does he navigate through the game? Changes his outcomes. So. Right. And that's exactly what life does. When everything is going great, life throws you a curveball. And some people, you know, they're really confident. They go, well, it's because of this curveball that it put me on the path where I am today. I have a lot of bitter things to say about that particular thing because yep. life's full of peaks and valleys. Yeah. Yeah. It comes in threes. And that may be sort of slightly true because things do happen in threes quite a bit. And you know why, right? Positive will be one. Negative is another. And what's the third? Zero. Hmm. That's what you got to have. You got a positive side, you got a negative side, and dead smack in the middle is what? Zero. Gray. Nope, zero is the neutral. <sighs> dun, dun, dun. No, I don't like it. That's all. So. I know. Yeah, hey, this is what I thought. Driving home with a rotary chicken and some salad and some de- delicious French bread mm-hmm. when I brought it up to you and said, you know what? No. <laughs> No, 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 no. Now, you know, and what about the whole divine intervention or somebody looking out for that's you, guardians what, and all that kind of stuff? That's where I was biting what are my those? tongue. You know, or, so. you know, or the, what is that? In gameplay bonuses or punishments? I don't. I'm not see, a gamer. It's just a different set of variables. Yeah, and I don't. You know what that is? That's a subliminal way to keep you playing the game. To keep you interactive, to change things. Which, that's a great point, considering that that incentive is wearing thin for a lot of people. Well, yeah, because this just it's like stoking the fire. Yeah. N- no, it's not stoking the fire. It's well, like- it depends on the situation that you're in. If it's a positive side, it's stoking the fire. If it's on the negative side, maybe it's tamping down the fire so that you don't burn out. Because all, it's all about energy, right? Mm. At the end of the day, energy can be neither created nor destroyed. I'm so you need a balance. As if you continue to hang an incentive in people's faces without proof of incentive, they're not going to keep playing. So, so what you got to do is you got to give them a little bit. You got to give them a little taste of the carrot that you're dangling. Mm-hmm. See, <laughs> it's what it is, man. Hmm. It's what we are. We're all just hairless monkeys speaking monkey gibberish. And that's why we can't have disclosure. <laughs> Would you stop with that? <laughs> so we're thinking about doing a new section of the podcast saying, this is why we can't have disclosure, where we put the best, and this is that's sarcastically, of humans in our podcast and, and references of things that, that prove that we're the best, you know, and that we're ready for disclosure. Like when you were talking about that one guy who basically had got into a crossbow fight and was like, I see your crossbow fight and raise you a flamethrower fight. Oh, where was it? It doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. But see, that was the whole thing. So I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about this on the way and we started talking about it and we're like, we should do a podcast. Because if you've been listening to our podcast, you know that this episode is supposed to be uh, our experiences at the Marfa Lights. <laughs> and we even put a video up 
uh, unedited, just basically cell phone video. We went to Marfa, Texas and recorded about 10 and a half minutes of the Marfa lights and put that video up on YouTube uh, on our Creep Geeks YouTube channel. And we also shared it to Facebook, so it's on Facebook as well. So if you're interested in seeing the Marfa lights, which are much like the Brown Mountain lights or spook lights, right? These mysterious lights that nobody really knows what the cause is, uh, you can watch it. And we, we suggest you do so. So we do have a link to that, and you can see that. And you can also go to our Facebook page where you can interact with us. Because we like the interaction. So, you know, hey, you can take your NPC character and interact with our NPC character. So, but that, you know, that whole this is why we don't get disclosure thing. What happens to those NPCs when something weird like this happens? Like, like I was talking about the crossbow incident. That happened in North Carolina. That's a variable. And then what you were saying, Florida man uses flamethrower to settle parking dispute. (laughs) (laughs) See? You got to have some weirdness, right? Because there has to be a variable in there that sort of sets things off in a way that can reset things. To convince us we're not in a simulation? No, not necessarily. Keep you in check. Okay. You know? And so there's just some general weirdness. And I think sometimes... Um, things need to be sort of cleaned up and defragmented, if you will, like the old school hard drive. You had to defrag them every once in a while. I think sometimes you got to clean some things up a little bit. And also, I think that the simulation actually tests boundaries. Hmm. So, I mean, think about it like this: if you were going somewhere and you were in a parking parking lot, and somebody you know took your spot or whatever, and you basically uh, were unhappy with that. And you decide to escalate it to a flamethrower level, <laughs> the person that's you know on the other end of that flamethrower level escalation is probably going to think twice about it, thereby keeping that guy in check because that guy snatches parking spots all the time. Okay, right? Doesn't care. So it's a learning because experience. that person who thinks that you know they are the end all be all and will just take your parking spot, right? Not being considerate or put their <laughs> shopping cart up, right? That's the kind of person that needs to know that they're an NPC. And that other NPCs exist as well. So how do you do that? You bring a little flamethrower in it. You see what I'm saying? Because see, and that's the no. problem. That's the problem with this entire thing is that if we are in a simulation, it is a almost perfect simulation, right? In its imperfection, because it's got to be balanced to maintain a certain energy level. Mm. If the simulation is there. Uh, as a way to harness energy, let's just use like the matrix, right? That was the entire thing. You you had all these humans. The humans were there to power the matrix, which powered everything else. Yeah. They were energy. They were batteries. But it also builds an argument that other people can not, that other people do not have to contribute or provide energy. Yeah, but they, by very nature of themselves, do provide energy. For every bar, every person that's providing a little bit of energy, there's somebody else that's providing way more energy. And then there's somebody who's providing no energy. Right. Positive, negative, neutral. Dun dun dun. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to exist in that. So you're not. You you don't exist in that. Can you prove that? <laughs> I can't not prove it, and neither can you. At the end of the day, you take your fake choice and move on. (laughs) Fantastic. (laughs) So there you go. So if you've stuck with us in this particular podcast and you've rambled down this wormhole with us, you're welcome. Or you hate us. Either way, let us know. We have a a way for you to contact us. It's a toll-free number that you can use uh, to express uh, your pleasure or disdain at our topic today. Yeah. That phone number is going to be 575-208-4025. Yes. Yeah. So you, you can go. also visit our website. So just go to creepgeeks.com and click on the contact us form and you can fill that out with all your angry or upset or hurt feelings that we live in a simulation. Yes. And you can explain to me why you don't live in a simulation if you'd like. And I can say... That's something that a person who lives in a simulation would say. Yeah. And your your answer will contribute to a data collection of simulation experiences. That's right. So you take your fake choice and you let us know how it goes. So there you go. Mm-hmm. 
So this is the part of the podcast where we get to wrap it up. Okay. This podcast has been brought to you by us <laughs> and our patrons. We do want to thank our patrons for supporting us. If you are interested in supporting us on Patreon, visit the links in the show notes. Also, be sure to check us out on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, um, and our website. You can even visit us on Twitter where we just make general announcements about new podcast episodes. Our podcast is available on on major podcast platforms, including Spotify, Pandora. Hey, I think you can even type our name into Amazon and find us. Um, Yes, because we are on Audible as well. Yeah. We do have some newer videos available on our TikTok. Give us a follow. We're trying to grow our presence on both TikTok and Instagram. We appreciate it. Our Facebook group is always active, and that's where we get some of our best show ideas and contributions. Yes. Yeah. So, Andy, there you go. We do appreciate you taking time listening to the Creep Geeks podcast. This has been our episode number 231, where it says be a paranormal skeptic or don't. It's all a simulation, and we know what your role is. So, I'm Greg. I'm Omi. And we'll see you next time. Bye.